Hi. Um, this talk is about an afternoon hack that I did that was inspired by a tweet that a coworker had sent out. And I thought, you know, I don't know anything about Ember.js. And what he was describing to me seemed like a very trivial problem. So I thought, why not try a new technology? Uh, we just had the panel, but I'm Atmos on the internet. I work at GitHub. Uh, I write server-side stuff. Uh, so we've released things like Hubot, which is a chat robot, uh, Camo, which is a SSL proxy. Um, but I never really enjoyed writing JavaScript or learned it to any you know, really comfortable level until Node.js came out. And that was the first time that I saw that I could be using JavaScript in my day-to-day -day work. So everything started with a tweet from my coworker, Brian Dahl, who said, my JavaScript is a mess. Um, and I had gotten it on a Saturday afternoon, and I had a few hours that were free. And I was just like, you know, maybe, maybe I can figure out what to do with this. And so I actually went and looked at his code. And it was kind of crazy to me. Um, I, he had taken jQuery and inlined everything into the top of a file. And his idea was just to make this application that was a tiny HTML5 app that identifies users talking about GitHub who have a lot of followers. So not just everyone mentioning it, we wanted people with, say, more than 15,000 followers or 20,000 followers or 100,000 followers. And we wanted to know what they were saying about us. And Brian works in marketing. So this is actually very important for us because he found that we had someone who was writing about us who you know, tweets to 250,000 users. And we had never reached out to them to even just say thank you for talking about the things that we wanted. So this was really important to him. Uh, but yeah, the, the code definitely freaked me out. So I looked at the top and I thought, this is a template. It's HTML that you want to shove in. Uh, it shouldn't just be one big concatenated string. Uh, hitting Twitter uh, to figure out whether or not the user had uh, a lot of followers was also expensive if you have a lot of people talking about your stuff. And so yeah, I figured that uh, maybe Ember would be a fun solution to this because it was all single page and I could just do it all as you know, a static file and this should be cool. So just to give you an idea about Ember, um, it's a JavaScript framework that simplified a lot of things. Uh, it actually handles complex interactions on the website very well. Uh, instead of firing off four different Ajax calls to refresh different parts of your document, you can build logic into your code that allows all of those things to be updated when your data changes in one place. Uh, and it's designed to work with people building API applications. So if you're building a mobile application, the same backend could be powering your mobile application that you could also build an Ember.js application on top of. So the few core concepts that you need to understand are uh, the first one is bindings. And so you can see, you know, we're creating an object called uh, the president. The name is Barack Obama. But the cool thing is that you can delegate these things. And so the president name binding will actually invoke the, the, the constant, basically. And we can do different things, but they, they bubble up between the objects very well. And it, it turns out that you can keep data in sync a lot of ways like that. The other thing is computed properties. So you can have an object that you create, and you can declare attributes on it. But you can also declare a function that is a property. And it says that this property should be invoked just like a normal property, but it relies on the other two. So if first name or last name changed, the full name function would be kind of reevaluated, and you would be able to, to reference it in a, in a different way. Uh, the other cool thing is the auto-updating templates. So they use handlebars as their templating system. And you can tell the templates you know, which properties uh, need to be in the code. And this is all tracked by Ember. So anything that's in these templates, when the underlying objects are changed, it's going to be reflected in the markup immediately, or once it's gone through and made sure that everything is satisfied. So my idea for 
the application that uh, my coworker wanted to build was let's call it outreach. Uh, that seemed like a good way to see, you know, if people were talking about us, we wanted to reach out to them and fi figure out whether or not uh, this, this would be kind of cool. Uh, the first iteration was a simple Ember app application uh, with an array and a controller, and it sort of looked like this. So you could go and you could see that free reader says, will you sponsor my novel? And you don't know how many Twitter followers they have. Uh, it wasn't as, as good, but it was roughly the same amount of code that Brian had written. So the way that it works is you define uh, at the top on line 36, the EM application create. That's kind of the top level namespace and everything is going to live inside of Twitter. And there's the ready function, which is once the, the entire DOM is loaded and the JS is loaded, uh, this ready function is going to be called. So I set a small interval to refresh every few seconds uh, the search results, uh, set the query to search for the word GitHub, and below that I've made a, a simple object that allows me to reference the tweets that I get in a very simple fashion. So when I get a piece of JSON back from the Twitter API with all of the user information, I can create a tweet object and I can reference properties like user link and tweet link, and I'm able to work with them very trivially inside the templating system because I'm defining all of these convenience functions. Um, and so, yeah, we used computer properties here to handle the markup. And the other thing is the, the, the ready function is setting the search results query and then it's calling super. So it has to bubble things up uh, so the, the other functions get called. But that's kind of the initialization. And the other thing is the array controller which means I'm going to have an array of quite a few objects that uh, are actually that tweet object, the one that was created in the last one. So at the top there's uh, content and query and ID cache, but the line 67 is when I get a tweet from the Twitter API and I want to say, should I display this or not? And I want to go through and look up the number of followers they have and if they have more than 1,000 followers, I want to put them in the array, and there's a little bit of stuff there that keeps you from duplicating uh, the same record as you search over and over. Uh, and then the refresh function is called every time, uh, if you see on line 97, it observes query. So there's an attribute that you can change over time. So you could have an autocomplete bar, and every time it changed that variable, this function would be fired off again, and you could check. So in our case, it's searching in the, in the previous slide for uh, GitHub on line 43. When I set that query attribute, the refresh function fires off and it goes out and finds tweets for us. Uh, and the handlebars template looks fairly similar as well. So the loud tweets about GitHub, it's a simple HTML ordered list. It iterates over all of the search results that we have in the array controller and it throws a little bit of the information in there. So the user link property that I defined on the tweet class, uh, I'm using there with the word unbound in front of it, which means don't put this inside of a special div that Ember uses internally to update it, because I know this is never going to change. Uh, whereas you know uh, some of the other ones, I'm just interpolating from user. Uh, the tweet link is also unbound. But then if you look at the tweet text, that's actually not HTML escaped. That means I'm getting information in that I trust and know to be good, whereas the default for all of this stuff is to HTML escape it, which with you know, the way the web is, you kind of have to do that all the time. Um, and this worked. So I was happy with myself. I had done the same thing my coworker had done, but I wasn't really sure that it was that much cleaner than what he had done. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll keep working on it. And I had it working. And then I ran into rate limiting. So doing this all on the client side means once I look up 150 users in an hour, Twitter tells me to go away. And I'm going to get 400 bad requests. And I thought to myself, oh, this is HTML5. You know what I should use? I should use local storage. Local storage will solve this. And so I went and looked, and Ember has built-in local storage stuff. So you can tell it to use uh, the store, the persistence layer, is, uh, takes an adapter type, which is local storage and bulk commit, 
So anytime you make a change and tell it to store the object, it'll be written. And then you had to make, and then I had to make an underlying model for that. So Twitter.user basically just has the name, the number of followers, and a link to their username. And so I you know, thought this would be really cool. And just uh, notice that the DS model extend is different than the EM object extend. So the DS means data store, whereas the EM stuff is normally an in-memory object. And then finding users becomes pretty easy because I can say find this user and it will go and get all the users from the store and it'll say can I find this person and if it can return them, otherwise go to the API. And so this was, you know, uh, I, was, I was so happy that I had figured out a use for local storage because I hadn't ever really found it that useful. And then there were still drawbacks to this. So I'd still get rate limited for busy things. Like you'd still easily have 150 people an hour doing that even though you could go back and look them up. Twitter would still tell you you're trying to do too much. And if I tried to show my roommates in my house, we were all on the same IP. So caching it on their system and caching it on my system was silly and it would never actually work. And to top it all off, local storage will only allow you to store five megs in most browsers. So that fills up very quickly when you have a lot of traffic. And this is basically where frustration set in. So all I wanted to do was show someone else on the internet how truly easy it could be to do something. And I'd spent hours learning about Ember and I was no closer to the solution that Brian had posted to us. And so I suddenly started thinking about, you know, what would I do if I wasn't trying to use Ember? And I thought, maybe I'll go server side with this. So the rate limiting had frustrated me enough that I figured I could create a service backed by myself and I could share it with other people. And it's trivial and free to get a node, to get a node application running there and they provision a DB and I could use whatever language I want. But I figured since I was writing JavaScript, I'd use Node, and I'd write it in Express. And Express.js is awesome. It feels like Sinatra, if you've ever used that in Ruby, but it has a lot of really powerful middleware available for it via Connect. And it's also just pretty solid, and it's been maintained over the last few years, unlike a lot of things. Um, so I, the, the code for making this work on the app side in the Node.js app in Express was a simple endpoint. And I could say, you know, give me a username. I have to set some headers in order for the Ember you know, code to trust me. But if I have it, I send back the data as a JSON blob, just like Twitter would have. And then all I had to do was cache all of this in Redis. And Redis was cheap enough for me. And what I could do was export a function that I could access from my application that said, get me a user from cache. And if the user didn't exist in cache, it would get it from the API and set the expiry for a day. So I never had to worry about too much stuff being in the database, and I never had to worry about paying for a larger database as the data set started to grow. Um, and the other cool thing is, since this was server side, and anybody using the HTML5 app, uh, I could put Twitter user credentials in there, which gives you significantly more uh, API requests per hour. So suddenly it was kind of awesome and it made everything a whole lot easier. Um, so suddenly we were sharing. And you know, with the caching in place, I sent a URL to Brian and he could see it. And it was like, wow, okay, we're, we're in good shape. I wasn't eating up his API stuff at his house. And he was rate limited then too because we had to wait an hour every time we wanted to change this. So we just had to twiddle our thumbs until it was up. Um, and the thing that stinks is a lot of these apps are so cool when you show somebody on your laptop, but they're difficult to show other people and get a whole bunch of people to use. And you know, now I was presented with the idea of like, where do I even put this Ember app? Like, If it's on my laptop, I can send him a GitHub repo and tell him to clone it down, and it'll all work with the same pieces. But I figured you know, the easiest way to share this might be GitHub pages, which will host static files for you uh, very happily and things just kind of work. And so uh, you can basically put all your stuff in a branch in your GitHub repo, and it's called GH Pages. And if the code exists there, it'll be hosted under a, user, under a domain name that's mapped uh, just like your username, and it's nice and simple. And so I could finally send it to him and say, oh, 
it's, it's alive, guys, it's alive. And so I could send it to him, and Brian was like, oh my gosh, thank you. Um, you know, and it was, it was super powerful, but I found that it was useful to others too, because my girlfriend does a very similar thing, and she works on a product called Prismatic. And so she was able to go there and say, oh, since they have a larger audience than mainly developers, uh, it, you're able to hack query parameters into the URL bar to change the number of followers that people need to have and also change the query string. So it turned out that by building this for my buddy, it was useful to other people too. And because I could share it, I didn't have to tell her that she needed to know how to use Git and clone the code down and open it up and all of the other things that, that complicate it. Um, but there were a lot of frustrations with this for me. Uh, I, I expected this to be like a three hour afternoon hack. And what I found is that the Twitter API, you know, uh, basically was, was really frustrating in trying to build something that would be much better suited for building around authenticated requests uh, would have been a, a much wiser idea. And a lot of this could have been simplified if I just made it an OAuth application, but you still have the problem of where do you put your credentials in the application if it's all a static page. Um, and there were certain parts of Ember that really frustrated me, and this was about three or four months ago when I did this. And I went back through the docs last night just to see how different they were. And a lot of the things that really I didn't like that first iteration are, have been cleaned up or things that I wish existed like nested view partials and things like that do exist now. And uh, I, was, I was pretty happy with that. But the, the cool thing there is that their documentation is just really top notch. I know very few open source libraries that work this way. Uh, where people took the time to write beautiful documentation that you can go through and find something. Um, and so I got the majority of the site working, you know, in, in about three or four hours. The rest of it was frustrating in trying to get it out there. But it was enough to get running and my natural reaction wasn't to just say, oh, I'll just go use something that I already know. It was easy enough to get going and as I learned more and more about it, uh, I found that all of that stuff was, was actually pretty solid. Uh, but I really just should have used a REST API from the beginning because they have built in, uh, the same way they have a local storage adapter, you can basically swap the adapters out and say, oh, go to this REST endpoint for this type of class. And it, it just sort of works. So if you want to go through and see this stuff, uh, the name of the project is Outreach. You can mess around with it. Brian Dahl actually open sourced his and continued to use jQuery, but still has the rate limiting problem. So I don't know if he actually uses it. Uh, Ember.js is also a really awesome resource. That's where all of the documentation is. And the last one is something that I found the other day, which was pretty cool. Whereas I used Redis for the data store, um, someone had done a single page app in Elasticsearch. So they could not only host the code inside of Elasticsearch, but they could use Elasticsearch as the data store for them. So it's all running in the same server, but it's not really running uh, a normal web server that you'd think of. But it's a, it's a pretty amazing trivial example. So thank you very much. Uh, no one from GitHub has ever come to China, so really thanks for having us. Um, my coworker Alex is here too. Uh, sorry, Vicent couldn't get here, but he couldn't get a visa. But we're very grateful to have to, for you guys to have us. So thank you. You want Ma? Any questions? Okay. I'm a beginner of uh, Amper Jazz, yep. and uh, I learned Amper Jazz in one month. And I found a lot of magic in Ember. Yes. But, <laughs> but sometimes I'm confused, like a, a read controller. Mm -hmm. So then I turn to the backbone. The backbone has the routers and the collection. Yep. And uh, why, why Ember called a read controller? <laughs> it should be a read collection. Or, or just a read controller control, uh, combine the routers function and the uh, collection function. Yeah, I think that they actually have. Um, I think they've fixed it up a bit. Some of the documentation that I was looking at, even in the last few months, they've changed the, the wording, so it might be better now. 
Uh, I'm not really sure. Backbone's another thing on my list that I haven't played with beyond a trivial example, and it probably wasn't even as in-depth as this. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Hmm? Uh, okay, you have the second question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> another question talk? is <laughs> that uh, I use Backbone with the jQuery Mobile do a web app, mm -hmm. and I found a problem with about routers. Yeah. The jQuery Mobile has own routers. They mm -hmm. have a very good transitions between the page changes. So slide, slide, uh, and slide right like this. So when I don't know the, uh, when we use the Empress with the jQuery Mobile, mm -hmm. uh, how to deal with the router complex? I'm not really sure. I think the easiest thing would probably to be on, to ask on their mailing list. Uh, they do have one. So if you go to EmberJS.com, there's a way to get help. Uh, and I don't think they go through that, but I'm not sure how to integrate it with jQuery mobile. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hmm? Uh, you have Wait, wait, wait. Before you use AmberJS, have you uh, do you have any experience with other MVC uh, JavaScript framework? Not really. Um, I played around with I think Sammy JS was one of the earlier ones that was built very much in the style of Sinatra, and I played around with that, but I don't think it was as kind of full fledged. I guess recently they had Throne of JS or something like that, and I still don't fully understand the differentiation, but. Ember was the framework of choice, and Backbone was the library of choice. And when I go through and look at the functionality, I don't see too much difference there. Um, but I'm normally not a, a client-side guy, so this was more of a, an experiment for me. <laughs> but do you do you know or no? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He went. Ember has two-way data bindings, like knockout. Okay. Yeah, so Ember has two-way data binding like Knockout does. Mm -hmm. So that's a really big feature, and they built a lot of stuff around it. Yep. Um, so that kind of made it into a framework. Gotcha. Um, okay. The other thing is they pay a lot of attention to composition mm -hmm. of you know sub views and, and views inside views and yep. pe like pieces putting pieces of your app together. Yeah. So Backbone is has does not have that at all. Yeah, you okay. just get views and, and you use like a third-party library like Marionette if you want to compose them. Gotcha. Um, cool. That's my understanding. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Uh, do you have custom domain names with GitHub pages? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> that was an easy one. Hey, no problem. We have two minutes time. Answer. Two minutes, right? Okay. The last question. <laughs> Electric sheep. <laughs> Electric sheep. Electric sheep. <laughs> okay. Ah. Have you a question? Last question. He just asked that question. Have you? Okay. 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 I think he and I should just go hang out. Uh, <laughs> uh, another thing is about Nest View. Mm -hmm. So uh, in China, it's very dif uh, different from the US. Yeah. So in China, they have already uh, a very long page and with less uh, interactive. So <laughs> use Amper, we, uh, should we uh, uh, separate uh, every uh, block to a view or just a, a big view? I'm not sure I understand your question. If you want to show me after this, I can look at it with you. I don't, I don't okay. fully grasp what I'll you mean. Okay, thanks, Carl. I have a very important question. Hey, hi. Important question. Yeah. Have, have you, uh, give up with open source? Mm -hmm. All side? What? <laughs> <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> because I, I think GitHub will be blocked someday in China. I need GitHub. Ah, he yeah. means, you know, Chinese guys in, in China uh, sometimes cannot visit GitHub. 
Oh, <laughs> we we try really hard. I had never experienced that until I got here two days ago. That I just try to go to things that I expect and I couldn't. Um, <laughs> that was new to me. Um, but I I know that you know we're definitely trying to keep it available to people. I guess somebody was talking about a product called Git Cafe, where it's something that they're people are hosting in China, but they're interested in trying to set up mirrors for large projects, so it won't have to go outside. Um, but I really am not authoritative enough on the <laughs> legal stuff involved and why that happens or what you do to, to do it. But I was very happy when I got here that I could fetch my GitHub code because I couldn't get to a few other sites that I use regularly. So there's always GitHub Enterprise, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks, Kari. Thank you. Cool. <laughs>